Welcome back to Economics. This is Dr. Kling. And today's topic is I call public finance and public choice. And these are really two very different ways of looking at the role of government. The public finance view that I learned is that there you can think of government's role as having three things. One is allocation. And that's to ensure efficient allocation of resources. So that means supplying public goods because the market won't supply them, things like national defense because everyone has the incentive to be a free rider. Um, so public goods because people would free ride that is that they would uh, enjoy the good as long as someone else paid for it but if everyone tries to do that then the, it won't be supplied so that's why the government needs to supply public goods and then the government has to deal with externalities. It has to um, subsidize positive externalities. We talked about this a couple lectures ago. And it has to tax negative externalities. And just as a little point of reference, taxing negative externalities is often called doing a Pagu tax or a Paguvian tax because of a, an economist named Pagu uh, who proposed that idea. Okay, so that's allocation of resources. Now, something we haven't uh, talked about is how the government decides exactly how much to tax an externality or how much of a public good to supply because we don't really get market information about that. We have to de decide on that independently. So uh, I'll just make a little note here that there's no market information and economists have thought quite a bit about how to get the right information to supply to do the optimal sorts of reallocation. They really haven't come up with um, any uh, compelling solutions. It, it, there's, it's still sort of a, it would be kind of one person's opinion or guesswork or, or in most cases. But in any case, that's the allocation function. Then there is a distribution function. Um, and that's because even if markets are allocating resources perfectly, or they're allocating them perfectly, efficiently, uh, with the help of government taxes and subsidies and public goods provision, there's, st <coughs> there's still a distribution issue that, no that it could turn out that um, some people are badly served by an efficient allocation. And so in particular you have some people who could be very poor and others very rich. And so um, that <coughs> income will not be, or wealth will not be redistributed automatically by the market so um, only charity or the government can fix and charity will be limited by free rider problems. That is, uh, if you have a bunch of poor people and two rich people 
one of the each rich person could say, well, I really want the other rich person to take care of the poor people, and I'll free ride on that. Uh, so the only way you can get both of the rich people to uh, donate money to the poor people under that scenario where they could free ride is to use coercion, have government tax them in order to do that. So there's this distribution function. And the third function is stabilization. And that goes back to macroeconomics. So macroeconomics using taxes and spending to keep the economy near full employment. Okay, so that's macroeconomics, so we don't have to talk about that here. So the, but it, it is just, uh, when we talk about public finance, the public finance view, it's one of the three func broad functions of government. There's the allocation function, the distribution function, and the stabilization function. Okay, now I want to turn to something called public choice theory. The thing about public finance theory is there's an implicit assumption that uh, government is this omniscient, well-meaning institution that comes in to fix problems in the market economy. Public choice theory says two things. Uh, one is that government officials are self-interested. They're not this independent, omniscient, uh, perfectly moral institution. And the second point is that, and perhaps more important, that private individuals use government policy for their own ends. And this is known as rent-seeking. So if there is a uh, potential monopoly available, then in private individuals will uh, bid with the government to try to get control over a potential monopoly. Um, so, uh, <coughs> you know, examples of rent-seeking are going on as I discuss this. Uh, there's a um, merger proposal between two big wireless carriers. And the rivals don't want the merger. So they go to the government and say, stop the merger. Now there may be some public benefit to stopping the merger, but it's primarily the rivals that are involved. Um, another example that's been in the news a lot is that uh, the administration invested in some energy companies by giving them loan guarantees and you know first of all some of them have gone bankrupt but one of the issues involved is that they were um, that the uh, owners of the companies made large campaign contributions. And the theory of rent seeking would say, well, that's absolutely par for the course. That is, the rents, that is the profits that you can get from having a government loan guarantee will <coughs> be, will attract people to lobby for those profits and hence 
the owners who make large campaign contributions. Um, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, which were um, prominent players in the uh, housing industry, uh, had government guarantees that private shareholders and there were many private sector beneficiaries besides the shareholders. Uh, realtors in some sense benefited from the fact that Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae were supplying mortgage loans so there could be lots of real estate transactions and so on. So there was much rent seeking involved and um, so rent seeking involves some private benefits from public policy and the rent seeking part of it is all the lobbying it, that goes on and uh, in the case of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae it was really quite considerable that's been documented in a number of stories on the financial crisis just how powerful politically the executives were at Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and how effective their lobbying and their political campaign contributions were. So what ordinary people would call corruption, um, this public choice theory calls rent seeking. Again, the rents are the private benefits and the process of seeking those rents, again, ordinary people would call lobbying or bribing if we were, if we were actually going that far. Uh, there's another nice phrase in public choice theory called the bootleggers and Baptists coalition. Uh, the idea is if you, for example, have a law that prevents um, that limits liquor sales or prevents legal liquor sales, then the bootleggers benefit just as the people who, you know, the Baptists who are presumed to want to um, stop the thing for mor moral purposes. So um, in the case of, let's say, environmentalism, the Baptists would be people who want a, you know, a cleaner environment, and the bootleggers would be companies that benefit from environmental regulations. So if, uh, if you're competing with the oil industry or with the coal industry, you want to see uh, oil <coughs> and coal uh, taxed in some way, uh, and you're the bootlegger. Or more uh, generally, let's say you, you want to start a, uh, a carbon market, which is what uh, Enron wanted to do. They wanted to have a a cat, a a market that would trade uh, the rights to use carbon and uh, also trade, you know, the the ability to s save on carbon, sort of create a market in that. Well, Enron wanted to create a market in that, and so and it, some environmentalists think that a market like that would be able to raise the cost of carbon use and therefore by reduced carbon so the again you have a bootleggers and Baptists type coalition so a combination of rent seeking which is the bootleggers and then you might say genuine public interest which is the Baptists in this in this model uh, and so you'll see <coughs> so that's a story of public choice theory. So public choice theory takes a very cynical view of um, so public choice theory takes a very cynical view of the role of government, whereas the public finance theory uh, is just is assumes that government is is acting purely in the public interest and just sort of asks, well, what would an omniscient, benevolent government do? Uh, whereas, again, the public choice theory is an attempt to take a cynical view that might explain why government wouldn't work 
to optimize along these the dimensions that the public finance theory would suppose. So it's part of a what I call the great debate, and I have a much longer uh, discussion of the great debate in a different video.